Welcome to episode 87 of the Ski Podcast and thanks for joining us. Today we're going to be chatting about skiing in resorts as diverse as Lezark, Gestatt, Yadmos, and if you've never heard of that resort, then keep listening. Plus, we've got snow reports and we'll be going behind the scenes of Ski Sunday and BBC's coverage of Beijing. I'd like to start by thanking Switzerland Tourism for sponsoring the podcast. It does remain the simplest country to go to if you've got kids in tow and you're thinking about half term. There's no extra rules in place for the under 16s and there's no test required for going into the country. A little later, we'll be finding out more about Grindelwald and the Jungfrau region, as well as Coral Montana. Now, my name's Ian Martin. I'd like to introduce my guest today. Firstly, I'm delighted to welcome four-time Olympian and BBC Ski Sunday presenter Chemi Alcott. Hi Chemi, how are you? I'm very good, hello guys. This is your second live appearance on the podcast. You joined us, I noticed, almost exactly a year ago to the day in episode 67. It's a slightly longer gap for Rob Stewart. He last joined us in episode 41. Hi Rob, how are you? Hi Ian, yeah great, I'm great. I'm in Switzerland, uh, in Crom Montana. It's super snowy here at the moment as well. So, oh, arrived here today, tons of snow in resort and I'm just I've been skiing for quite a few days already, but I am looking forward to getting out tomorrow. And we're also joined today by our regular equipment guru, Al Morgan from SkikerInfo.com. Hi, Al. How are you going? Hi, Ian. I am good. Thank you. Yeah, not quite as snowy. I'm in southwest London. I'm delighted to report I was skiing last weekend in Les Arc. That was a brilliant, brilliant trip. It was so good to get on uh, skis again. But let me start by asking my guests when you last skied or snowboarded. Let's start with you, Chemi. When were you last on snow? I have just done a big stint, obviously ending up with Ski Sunday. Um, and my last day was on Friday and I skied with my boys. It was absolute carnage in Flen. Um, Cooper, who's three, is ridiculously overconfident and underskilled. But unfortunately, <laughs> he can now throw his skis down, get them on and ski away from me before I had to help him put the bindings on. So I knew I had, you know, a grace <laughs> period of getting prepared. Now he, he clips in and he's just off. It's got a whole new level of, uh, of stress for a solo parent. I, overconfident and underskilled sounds like a, a lot of young men's uh, estimation of their own their own abilities. What about yourself, Rob? You're in Cromontana. Have you skied there or yeah. when did you last um, ski? Yesterday I was in Verbier and the sun came out and it had snowed the night before. And, you know, I yeah, it was brilliant. I went down Col de Mouche. If anyone knows Col de Mouche, did that a couple of times. And then went up Mongelay. I haven't been up Mongelay in, I can't remember the last time I went up Mongelay. Because... Brilliant. Well, we'll be talking about that a little bit later on. Right, I've got a very important question for my guest today that I really think we should cover now. I read in the last week, did you know that the Dutch call drag lifts pancake lifts? Has any of you ever heard that before, Chemi? I just heard that the other day and I had to call a friend I had and ask if that was true. And they said, yes. And I was like, actually, what? I get it. I have broken three lifts in the last six months <laughs> myself. I, in the summer, I broke a T-bar. I don't know if I've put on a lot of weight recently or if I'm just, the forces are all in the wrong way, but I broke two T-bars in the summer. And then the other day I was on a, on a pommer, on a drag lift and half, you know, they're circular, half of the circle broke off. Pancake, exactly, they're pancake. Well, I had a, a moon shape on my bottom on the way up. It was so uncomfortable, but I didn't get off because I didn't want anyone to see that I'd broken this pancake lift. Well, at least that explained why they call it a, a pancake lift. Then that's I've your got a theory. I've got a theory about that, uh, the Dutch uh, calling it a pancake lift. Maybe it's because when they get on the lift, they have a, a cigarette and then they go for a schmock and a pancake. <laughs> <laughs> it's the accent that does it. <laughs> well, that one might be lost in translation. Um, I'm going to move on now to the Battleface Travel update. So I'm here with uh, Katie from Battleface Travel Insurance. Great to have you back on the uh, show, Katie. How are you? I'm great, thanks, Ian. Great to be here again. Excellent. Now, they, it's wonderful to have you on the show when we have very few changes in the travel rules to cover. We've been caught out so many times with changes at the last minute. Um, it's great. I think the main news probably is that as we predicted in episode 87, those day two tests for, for double vac skiers on the way back, they're on their way out, I think. Yeah, that's right, Ian. The UK government plans to drop day two antigen testing, which is currently mandatory for all vaccinated arrivals and those under the age of 18 in time for the February half term. So the plans, which have been welcomed by the travel industry, are set to be scrapped from the 11th of February in the latest easing of travel restrictions. It save families hundreds of pounds on the cost of, of their ski trip. Yeah, can I just check, though? If, you're, uh, if you've got children who are under 15 or only single vaccinated, they still need to take a do day two test. That's right, yeah. They still need to take a day two test, yeah. 
Yeah, so, you know, they do need to take a test, but overall, you know, it's less expensive. And uh, the good news is, I think from today, as we speak, the NHS pass is actually available for 12 to 15 year olds. That's, that's correct. Yeah, to help teens, um, the NHS app is now theoretically accessible for 12 to 15 year olds. But we have um, anecdotal evidence that teenagers are still finding it difficult to get this and GP surgeries are not always that helpful. Parents we know are resorting to print out medical records to ensure that a newly turned 16 year old can access public spaces in France. Yeah, well, uh, hopefully these might be teething problems over the next couple of days. I'm going to get my kids to try and sign up for it. So we'll find out uh, for myself. And otherwise, as I mentioned earlier, not really many changes. I think Switzerland uh, remains the easiest place to travel. I don't know if you know, Katie, but I've decided to take our family to Switzerland. We've bit the bullet because it's just simpler. My kids are single vaccinated, all sorts of other complications. If they're under 16 going to Switzerland, that's it. There's no problems at all. Uh, whereas in the other three main countries, there are still restrictions. Do you want to just briefly run through what those are if you're if you're traveling with children who are um, not double vaccinated? Yeah, absolutely. As you say, in um, Switzerland is definitely the best option for a stress free ski this winter and the easiest option for families skiing right now. Uh, the country is open to unvaccinated and easy for unvaccinated teens. Moving on to um, you know Italy, France, Austria. Then what's the situation there if you've got a uh, twelve to fifteen year olds who are not vaccinated? Yeah, so Austria, um, children aged twelve or over can use the first PCR test of a holiday in Ninja Pass to enter Austria. In France, teenagers aged between twelve and fifteen can access public spaces using the pass sanitaire. Uh, which can be activated for 24 hours. In Italy, the Super Green Pass can only be activated if you're fully vaccinated. So teens aged 12 and above are not able to enter bars, restaurants or hotels unless they've had two doses. So it's a bit of a no-go, really. But it's actually why we called off our, our, our family trip to Italy, because it just wasn't going to be possible. Thanks very much, Katie. That was brilliant. Hopefully you can join us again in uh, two or three weeks' time for the next episode. Absolutely. Look forward to it. Right, let's move on to snow reports. We've got um, one from each of the main countries around the Alps. We've got Vanessa Fisher reporting from uh, Italy, Stephen Spears uh, in Switzerland, Elena is reporting from uh, Austria where they've had a good amount of snow uh, this week and then finally uh, we've got some bloke called Ian who's uh, in France uh, and originally this was a, a YouTube uh, video hence my references uh, to being able to see so I'll put a link to that video in the show notes. Really happy to send you an update from the Italian Dolomites. I've been based in Val Gardena for three days and in that time have skied really the whole area, including yesterday a full circuit on the Sella Ronda, which also included going up to the Marmalada Glacier at 3,250 metres. The views were incredible. It's been blue skies and bright sunshine and really quite warm more like spring than january but um the pistes are in fantastic condition i mean this area prides itself on its um grooming and you see the the groomers go out at night more than i've ever seen anywhere but um the only places that were scratched off were the kind of steeper slopes coming down off the marmalada for example and the black run down into Selva at the end of the day gets a little bit scratched off, but there's no rocks. The piece up at Ceceda are absolutely stunning, wide open groomers, really great. And there's a bit of snow forecast for Monday and Tuesday, but sadly I'll have left by then. But if that comes, that would be great. With regards to COVID, um, they are really strict. Everybody has to wear their FFP2 masks and at almost every lift, they check. And if you're not wearing it, they either blow a whistle or point at you and ask you to pull it up. And actually the air's been quite cold. So having it on your face, I didn't find it was a pain. Every day you have to activate your lift pass. And with that comes the super green pass which is basically your NHS proof of vaccination. It's a really simple process, but you can't activate your ski pass through the lifts without it. So it's a system that works together. We chatted to one person today who had been checked on a lift that they actually had their ski pass and that it corresponded to their name, but otherwise there was no checking. But the system 
unlike France, where they seem to be randomly checking for your pass sanitaire, here your lift pass doesn't work if your super green pass is not on it. So it's pretty straightforward. Yeah, otherwise it's been quite busy, busier than I was expecting for January, but only really a couple of pinch points at a couple of smaller lifts. Otherwise, people spread out really nicely through the resort and it's been really fantastic to get back on the slopes. Hello, this is Stephen Spears with a quick snow coverage update for Verbi in Switzerland and I'm recording this on Wednesday the 2nd of February. The weekend arrived and I've got to say I was a wee bit apprehensive with the snow cover uh, given that it hadn't snowed for a few weeks here. Uh, I arrived on Saturday and I've got to say I was remarkably pleased with the condition of the pieces, full cover everywhere. Uh, there was uh, a little bit of scraped uh, snow here and there, a bit hard packed, but overall it was very good to ski on. Off-piste was a little bit hard, but actually it was still still okay. Uh, Sunday the off-piste softened a little bit and it was actually very good to ski on, I'll be quite honest, even though there was no uh, new snow and the pieces were even better on Sunday than they were on the Saturday. But I've got to say, going into the week, you know, uh, snow on Tuesday was good actually quite deep on some of the pieces, 10-15 centimetres, which made a big difference overall. But we were expecting about 20 plus centimetres uh, last night, uh, Tuesday night, which never really materialised. I think there's only about 5 centimetres have fallen when we were forecast, as I say, over 20. Uh, today, the uh, the pieces were a little bit uh, porridgey. The off-piste was a kind of similar uh, experience, but still good and still good cover. Uh, and anybody coming out is going to have a lot of fun here, I've got to say. Uh, but uh, I don't think there's much powder in the horizon in the immediate future anyway. But overall, all good cover and uh, great fun. Hello everybody, it's me Elena Protopopov from the Two World Tourist Board and I'm happy to give you a quick snow report from this week. So yes, we were the lucky ones this week. We had a lot of snow in Two World, like a real winter wonderland. So in several ski areas or perfect snow conditions, we did have almost half of a half of a meter fresh powder snow in the ski areas such as Sankt Anton, Gogel, also Meyerhofen and some further two Orleans ski areas. Hi there, this is Ian Martin from the Ski Podcast and I am out in the uh, Tarentaise region of France. I came by train this morning from London. Uh, we arrived very early, had breakfast in Bourg saint maurice and are now up in the mountains. And as I've been skiing around today, I've seen the re uh, resorts of Teen, which I can see in that direction. Uh, La Rosière, which is behind me, you can see uh, uh, Mont Blanc, and the other side of that is uh, Chamonix. Over in that direction to my right, I've seen La Plan, but right now I'm here in Les Arc. And I've spent the day really quite exploring Les Arc. I started in 1600, uh, made my way up to 1950, 2000, went up to the Agui Rouge, which is the highest point just over there at 3,200 metres. It was very, very cold up there this morning minus five and wind chill made it significantly colder than that but then there was a beautiful run down to Villa Roger after that uh, all the way down the lowest point of the Les Arc area 1200 meters made my way back up here um, over to Paisley uh, beautiful runs through the trees to Paisley and the laundry I uh, took the new the laundry lifter up I've just been over in uh, 1800 and now I'm going to make my way back to 1600 again. And the good news is I can tell you that the slopes are in really good uh, condition. You know, there hasn't been some snow uh, for quite a while. It's, it's hard packed. There's the occasional little bit of uh, ice, but otherwise it's pretty uh, grippy. Some of the snow is a bit uh, granular. Uh, it's been, you know, it's still, uh, as I said, been very cold. Uh, but the good news is, as you can see from Mont Blanc, perhaps behind me, they say that when Mont Blanc has a hat on, it means there's snow uh, to come. And I am told that in the forecast there is snow due, uh, probably on Tuesday of this week. So that will be very welcome, because that top-up would be required. But otherwise, yeah, in really good conditions here. Wonderful weather in, uh, in Les Arts in the Tarentaise. 
we mentioned that in Austria, uh, you have to take three tests in the uh, day with an inch pass. I know you've been out in Austria recently, uh, Chemi, and you mentioned to me earlier in the green room that the testing is actually slightly different. It's not the swab uh, type of test. Yeah, I mean, any adult knows that kids hate swabs. You know, they associate <laughs> it with pain. No one likes putting anything up their noses. And they have the gargle test in Austria. Um, so it's liquid. You gargle it for 30 seconds and then you put it back in. Also, you can go and get all the tests at the beginning of your holiday. They're all free. Um, and you do them privately and you just drop them off. So it's not as in when I when we were in France before Christmas with our ski team, we had to queue up at the pharmacy every night with everybody else in the village um, to test the kids. So they are trying all of the you know, all of the countries are trying to work together to to make it that we can go on family ski holidays. But I just wanted to highlight that because, I mean, I have a five year old who hates the nasal tests and, you know, it's quite he, he really detests it. Whereas the, the gargle test is much easier and their PCR tests in Austria. They turn around with these gargle tests very, very quickly. OK, excellent. Well, that does make it sound a bit easier. And as we mentioned, they're free tests in Austria as well. Talking about kids, if you are going out at half term, I'm just going to do a quick heads up for uh, Caroline Elliott, who I interviewed in episode 82, uh, her book Fjords Mountain Mission. You can buy that in different places around the place. It's great uh, for kids. We'll keep them uh, occupied and get them to learn a bit about avalanche safety. You've obviously seen that book before, Chemi. Yeah, it's really, really good. I think it's it highlights all mountain safety, which is very, very important. We did a feature on it last Sunday, actually, on mountain etiquette. And really, I've, I've actually noticed there's a lot of crazy people skiing around um, post pandemic, you know, regardless of risk. Um, so I think that book is really, really great for kids to start understanding, you know, how to survive in the mountains and how to take care of themselves. Well, um, we mentioned before that, uh, or I mentioned before that I was out in Les Arc, and you will have just heard my snow report there. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail but i did go out on the inaugural travel ski express ski train uh went out on friday night uh now i don't propose to go into it in huge detail now because i have already released a bonus uh, podcast episode about it so listener if you'd like to uh, find out more about train travel direct to the alps from london i highly recommend it have a listen to that uh, podcast you can find it in the stream or just uh, there'll be a link to it in the show notes now, regular listeners will know uh, that with the right conditions, there are plenty of places you can ski in the UK. And in our last episode, we found out about Allen Heads in Northumbria. And last week, I spoke to Peter Stockton from the nearby Yadmos Ski Club. Great. I'm here with Peter Stockton, who is chair of the Yadmos uh, Ski Club. Hi, Peter. Thanks for joining me. How are you? Hi, Ian. Yes, I'm fine. The reason I wanted to have you on is, uh, you know, we recently found out about the uh, Allen Heads uh, Ski Club on the podcast. And Yadmos is another of these uh, lifts uh, and ski areas in the UK. Do you just want to tell us where Yadmos is? Yeah, we're um, we're based in the North Pennines, so not too far away from Allen Heads. We're right on the eastern border of Cumbria the border with uh, County Durham. And one thing I noticed uh, looking at your uh, website is you've actually got what I would call a proper drag lift, like the ones that you would see in regular ski resorts. At least that's how it looked to me. Am I right? Yes, we've we've got a secondhand uh, auto stacking Palmer, which we bought from a uh, ski resort uh, near Grenoble. Right. Okay. How do, like how does that crop up? How do you find, go out and find yourself a pommel lift? Well, I, I, there's there's quite a lot of them being scrapped and being sold, um, particularly in France now. So there there is a second hand market there. Uh, I mean, I'm going back to 1988. That's when the club bought it and installed it. But I think I think they do still come up for sale. And on the website, it says that it's England's longest ski lift. So you know, how long is it, and how much terrain, assuming you have snow, would do people get access? To. The toe is 600 metres long. It climbs about 120 metres and the ski runs uh, are about 800 metres in length, so half a, half a mile in old money. <laughs> That's great. What sort of altitude are you looking at there then? The bottom of the toe is 600 metres and the, the top's about 725 metres. So what's the situation with snow? How many days of skiing might you hope to uh, open for in, in a winter? Well, it's 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 England, so it's highly variable. The worst <laughs> season we've ever had uh, so far was two days. I think that was probably 1988. The best season was over 40 days, and that would have been 2010. We don't 
quite know when the snow is going to be coming. We know there will be some skiing, but it's highly variable how many days we actually get. I get that. It's obviously with the altitude being relatively low, it's a bit like Scotland. The snow can arrive and then disappear uh, really quickly as well. But I, I love the idea well, of having like a proper drag. It's quite a decent, uh, you know, vertical uh, as well. Can people, you know, one of the questions I've asked about Allen Heads is, um, you know, can can anyone turn up or do you have to kind of pre-book? How does that work? No, normally we, we have sort of two forms of membership. We have people who buy season tickets and then we'll also sell day tickets as well um, if we've got enough capacity, which mostly is the case. So people can just turn up. They do need to be able to ride a fast pommer, though, and not everybody can do that. So it's not suitable for absolute beginners. But for, you know, for early intermediates onwards um, through to advanced skiers, there's, there's some good skiing at Yadnos. Who do you say like a, a, a fast pommer? I, like I, I know that some people, is it one of those ones that like kind of lifts you off the ground or anything like that? We've there been a few like that over Yeah, I mean, it years. can do. It, it, it moves about 3.5 metres a second. I think some people do struggle with the the flying start similar to the pommers in scotland really excellent and so you're quite near to uh alan heads are they your rivals do you have a, a bitter rivalry between you at all <laughs> no not at all not at all we we there's actually three ski clubs in the north pennines we weirdale's the third one and then of course we've got our colleagues over in the lake district uh which also isn't too far away either on the other side of cumbria so there are four active ski clubs that ski on real snow with with toes allen heads is um a kind of rope toes so yeah it's kind of more aimed at, at, at beginners yadmos is i'd say it's more kind of intermediate in can be can be really kind of quite uh challenging tell me an idea that you know we've been throwing around is you know since uh lockdown and like last winter where british skiers you know really can go anywhere can do any skiing did you find a lot more interest you know last winter and have you have you seen that continue you know since uh, the, the the pandemic yeah i mean it, it's such a shame we 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 started off really well last year but then unfortunately we got caught in the restrictions as well so we, we'd been open for three days and the snow was just getting better and better and better oh, no and we were we were just kind of cut down we were we were locked down on the 6th of january i think it was and we just the snow just got better and better and better but we couldn't run the tow because of the travel restrictions right how frustrating how frustrating but uh, have you seen for example this year you've got perhaps more members joining yes uh, memberships has been better this year definitely we, we have got more members uh, we just need the snow now yeah okay well i hope that i hope that comes down um one final question for you then peter yad moss seems like a very strange name what does it actually mean well yad as far as we can tell um yad is an old possibly an old norse term it's an old norse pennine term for a, for a pit pony so where we ski there were yeah. there were a lot of kind of small uh, drift mines and lead mines and 150 years ago, when those mines were working, they would have used small ponies underground to, to kind of drag the ore out. So Yadmos was probably where they, the ponies were, were, were fed you know, and, and grazed. Right. OK. And maybe early skiers were using them to, uh, to give them a tow <laughs> up the mountain as well. <laughs> I believe there is evidence that the, the Durham uh, lead miners uh, 200 years ago were... Uh, commuting to and from work on ski though it's not as recent as we might think it is right I like that I like that story a lot well Peter that, that's really interesting you know love to hear about uh, all the uh, ski areas around uh, the UK uh, and you know I'd like to thank you and all of the volunteers because I presume it's not a kind of commercial business you know you need volunteers no. to get that lift running and to uh, to make everything happen you know all of the people who put in their time to make it happen I wish you lots of snow uh, for the rest of the season Thank you, Ian. Yeah, check us out on theadmos.co.uk and you can see what it looks like when we get some snow. Yeah, I'll put a link into the show notes as well. That's brilliant, Peter. Thank you very much. So, um, Al, you you skied in Allen Heads. You were telling us about that uh, in the last episode. Have you ever skied in Yadmos? I used, I used to do a lot of climbing around there. No of it. I haven't skied there. It's not that far from Allen. It's about seven and a half K as the crow flies. It's not too far from Wheelhill. Northumberland is a nice little hotspot, that North Pennines <laughs> area. 
for skiing. Just a little known, that's all. Okay, well, put that one on your list uh, uh, next time you're back in your in your homeland. Now, before we go on to talk about Beijing, I'd like to thank everybody who's voted for the Ski Podcast so far in the Sports Podcast Award. If you do enjoy the podcast, I'd really appreciate it if you could just take a couple of minutes to vote for us at sportspodcastawards.com, and I'll put a link into the show notes. Now, let's turn to Shemi. We've only got two days until the Beijing Olympics start. Um, I think you're at home now and you're going up to Salford uh, tomorrow. Uh, you'll be working for the BBC there. I've got so many questions to ask you, but I want to start off with two words. Dave Riding. How good was it to be there when he made history? Absolutely phenomenal. I felt so much support from the whole British community who couldn't be there that I was trying to be loud for everyone who couldn't be there. <laughs> I, I was really emotional. Um, I knew he'd got a podium when he skied down into the lead. And then when the last two races DNF'd, it was just it was just so surprising. And yet we'd expected it from him for so long. We'd seen glimmers from Levy when he was in the lead and he had the green light. We knew it was there, but there's such few chances for him to deliver two perfect runs. Um, he's 35 years old and he's honed the skill to perfection that he deserved it more than anyone else. You saw the reaction to, to all of the other competitors, how much they were happy for him. And he, as he says, he's everyone's second best skier. Everyone in the world loves day riding before, <laughs> you know, a lot of them put them before their own home nation. So <laughs> I just think it was so well deserved. And he's got such a great story because it shows to, to so many young kids that you don't have to follow the pathway of the Austrians and the Germans by being born on the white stuff. You just have to be dedicated and persevere. He only ever skied on snow for the first time when he was an early teenager. So I just think it brings hope to everyone that there's an individual path for you to follow. Oh, it's such a good story. And I thought it was great as well that it got skiing onto the front pages in, in the UK as well, because it was such a story. It was so remarkable in so many ways. When I watched him on Ski Sunday, uh, because it's quite convenient in a way that the slalom uh, took place on the Saturday, didn't it? It was brought forward a day. They swapped the slalom and the downhill around. So I saw it uh, uh, on Ski Sunday. And that just that emotion when he realised he won and when, uh, you know, he was celebrating on the podium. I was so pleased for him. I've met him, uh, you know, a couple of uh, times and he genuinely is a nice bloke. And in fact, uh, if listener, you listen to the last episode, I cut in a bit from an interview I did before where he just talks about how he's not in it for the fame and for the for the glory. He's in it because he's competitive and he likes to race. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. We actually quite a background story. Ski Sunday, we didn't have the, the rights for the slalom. I was there as a super fan in the finish. And I said to my producer, if he's in the top 10 within a second, we have to be there with, with the cameras, with the boom bots, with everything. Like we need to be ready. And they were like, but we don't have the rights of this one. We've, we're, we're prioritizing the downhill because we'd already done the slaloms and we were doing schladming. Um, and I said, OK, yeah, I get all that. But we are the British press who are here this is going to happen. And I put quite a lot on the line <laughs> for this, you know, saying that he was going to podium um, again. And and obviously, I mean, he did. And yeah. it was just ridiculous. And the whole yeah. emotions of the team, I mean, being in the finish, watching everyone and seeing Laurie, Taylor and Billy running up. Laurie's got like lifting shoes on and dirty clothes because they were in their hotel. And they're like, oh my gosh, this is happening. And you have to like walk up quite far to the finish here in Kitzbühel. And then you had Tristan Glass Davis, his coach, he was numb. He was absolutely numb. He he looked like he was throwing up. He was like bent over the barrier, just shocked. And then obviously we saw the pictures of Jai Guy at the start, the technician who was so emotional. And it was just it was it was like seeing all this like patches of people who put so much graft and effort in, into Dave and knowing that his his fiance couldn't be there and was just watching at home on TV or live online because I think Eurosport couldn't show it live. I got lots of feedback from people who couldn't watch it live on Eurosport in the UK. Um, and it was just like, oh my God, everyone needs to see this. Like if you're interested in sport, not just skiing, if you're interested in sport, you need to get involved with this story and and, and hear this tale of success. Yeah, well, that certainly sounds like a, an occasion where instinct uh, paid off there in terms of making sure that you had the camera crew there and everything. And, you know, when, when I spoke to you last year, you were in Lax. Uh, and you were kind of based there for the season. And obviously this season on Ski Sunday was very different because you've been traveling around. I just wondered how, was it easy, like a normal season getting around the Alps? Or were there still a lot of hurdles you had to overcome getting the crew from one resort to another? 
Um, no, it was really challenging, um, really challenging for our logistics crew. We had to have tests all the time because we we're around the athletes in the area. Um, and Ed, myself and Zoe did get COVID. So we all had to do periods of isolation. That's why I missed Vengen. Graham Bell was there to do his camera run. So he took over the show. And then Jenny Jones was in Lux anyway um, to support with um, Red Bull TV and Ski Sunday. So she, that's where the kind of, we, we didn't really talk about it because we didn't want to put a downer on anyone. And we didn't want, definitely didn't want to stop people booking holidays to go skiing. Um, but yeah, no, so there was, there was a difficult chunk in there. I was very lucky. I isolated in Vengen with the most beautiful view and a balcony. But yeah, no, it was, it was tough traveling around. But also for me, I'd never seen a Men's World Cup live. So when I went to Adelboven and the, the fans were there, not as many fans as normal, but I went and as a, as a spectator watched the Giant Slam Marco Odom at one. And I was on that last ridge. I, uh, I snuck on with my BBC pass to that last ridge where the free fall is. And just hearing the Swiss fans, and this is, you know, I don't know, 50% of what they normally get was absolutely amazing. So I love being able to see all these events live and I feel so fortunate for that. Cool. Uh, that is really, really interesting. It actually links into my uh, kind of next question because I noticed on Ski Sunday, you know, and I just love Ski Sunday. I'm personally less interested in the racing uh, side of things. You know, I do tend to fast forward through uh, a bit of that, although obviously um, with day riding, I watched all of that. And I did watch all of the uh, the Lauberhorn uh, and the Hannah Calm as well. But I like the features. And I noticed this year, it seems like you've really mixed it up. You've explained now why Graham uh, was doing uh, presenting in, in Vengen. Uh, but you've also had Jenny Jones on, Amy Fuller, a really good interview that she'd done with Sean White. You had Tim Warwood and Woodsy, I thought... He came across as a real natural. I, I've never seen him kind of in a presenting role before. I thought he was great. He's possibly got a future there. Yeah, it, it's such a fun team. And I think everyone brings a bit of their own energy with it. Woodsy is phenomenal. He did a feature on Sheffield uh, at Sheffield Dry Ski Slope a few years ago. And he was quite quirky and he was finding his feet. But I thought, um, you know, the ultimate run and meeting Marcus, I mean, he is a legend. And you could see what it meant to Woodsy. And I mean, the footage from that piece was was ridiculous. I mean, I'm, I'm obsessed with watching the ultimate. And if you guys, everyone, please tell me you've all seen it. You're all nodding. Well, I'll put a link in the show notes, uh, listening, in case you haven't seen it. But it really is a, a work of art. And I noticed that that's, uh, that's organised by Paddy Graham, another one of those uh, skiers who came out of Pat Sharple's Grom camps, you know, back in the day, along with, uh, you know, Woodsy and Katie Summerhays and Tyler Harding and all of that. Paddy Graham now produces these videos for uh, Red Bull. Um, right, you've, I've got got more... watch, um, you've got to watch the behind the scenes because what I thought was amazing was that they created all those features themselves. So there's a bit where he's jumping off the avalanche bars. He actually went and put those avalanche bars up. Like there was a huge amount of hard work that went in. With, with those these ultimate runs and all the candy throw lines that they take, I think they're amazing. But I do have to shout out to the cameramen and women who are videoing them whilst doing it all. So a lot of it uh, we expect to be drones. But actually, there's a lot when you look at the behind the scenes. There is a camera person going down. And obviously, I'm on Ski Sunday and we have the best cameraman in the world called Zoid. His name's Chris Kirkham, but we all call him Zoid. And you know, we're there delivering to camp pieces to camera and skiing and going really, really rapid. He's trying to watch where he's going on public piece, film. I mean, these guys are absolute legends. So please respect the behind the scenes team. For sure. I mean, you know, once you've seen any video like that, you, you know that so much has gone into the production values, uh, you know, on, on all levels, whether it's actually creating the features or doing the filming. But I've got a more kind of I don't know if you want to call this a controversial question. I asked on a couple of forums, uh, you know, if people had any questions for you. And it's interesting, you know, I did a survey for the ski podcast about a year ago. And all it concluded uh, to me is that you can't please all of the people all of the time. <laughs> you know, you can you can please some of them. But some people out there, you know, they just want to uh, complain. And I noticed that in the forums, you know, there's a certain section of people who seem to think the BBC has been overtaken by a left wing woke agenda and complaining about, some of the features, you know, that are on there. I mean, the last episode had something about sustainability, which I thought was uh, was great. But also, you know, features, you know, covering uh, gender and sexuality as well. And I just wondered, you know, I know you editorially, it's probably not your uh, area, but I wondered about what your thoughts were on that. Yeah, I mean, we get this a lot. I get people messages saying, I want it all to be downhill racing. And then people like you, Ian, who are like, well, I fast forward that bit. And then people saying, I don't want it to be about snowboarding. But it's, you know, it's a, it's a mountain show. Then I get people 
saying, where's the bobsleigh? Well, it's like, well, it is ski Sunday, um, but we are allowing snowball because it's such a great community to share. I think that it has to be a rounded show. Like you said, really important. I don't produce it and I don't edit it. We also, um, some of the show is scripted. So top of the show, bottom of the show. When we do our chats, that's just Ed and I free for all. We get to say what we believe in, how we do it. And obviously the ski social is just fun and we get to be creative with that. But, you know, you, you'll never please everybody. I think we have to show a slice of the demographic of what is happening with the mountains and the changes that are happening. And I know like the sustainability piece, I was really passionate about that. And I saw it as something positive because of what Milan are doing. A lot of people were like, oh, what a shame to end on a downer. And I'm like, no, no, this is about taking care of the only world we've got so that we can still all enjoy the mountains. So like you said, you're not going to please everyone. There will be bits that some people love uh, and some people don't. Yeah, I thought the sustainability thing, which is an area I'm really interested in, was great. My only disappointment was you didn't mention to people that you can uh, you know, cut your emissions by taking the train. It's the easiest way you can make a difference if you're going out to resort. I'm putting my hand up now, Ian, because we were doing a feature, a really big story on that next winter. So I really? think, as you know, I'm really... I'm really keen to push the trains and the electric cars and everything. Um, and I've been pushing this for two years. Last year, we couldn't do it because we weren't traveling. This year, because it's all about features of Athletes of the Olympics, it wasn't the time. But that is definitely on the agenda. And I totally agree. And I will be coming to you uh, for information and support okay. on that. OK, well, I'll be delighted. To help. I'm also driving out uh, an electric car to the Alps in April, assuming, uh, you know, we're still allowed to travel then. But I've got a lot of experience on the train. Right. Let's move on to Beijing. We're not going to do politics. It's not really you know, my area. It is going to make a difference from everything that I've read about uh the, the Beijing games in terms of the athletes and the kind of bubble that they're in. And what I was interested in, I mean, you've been to four Olympic Games and part of it, I know you're there to compete. And that is the main thing. But there is a social aspect to it. And it's got to affect your preparations. I'm interested in, in your thoughts, Shemi, about how that really kind of strict bubble that surround the athletes is going to affect their preparations for their events. Yeah, I, I actually have been kind of obsessively searching on Instagram about what everyone's going through. And you see the food hall where you have glass containers to the side of you so you're not allowed to talk to anyone you're not allowed to socialize you know in my area I'm not going to lie there were condom boxes everywhere and they were trying to promote not sexuality but they're promoting everyone you know sharing this moment together this community feel this you've worked really hard for four years and this is this is the show this is the time to to light it up for you and show the world and these are all other people who you've never met before, who want to do the same thing. So you're sharing those emotions. And I think it is tough. But at the same time, we have an Olympic Games. Uh, these racers deserve to show their their hard work. And, and I just think they just they just want to get in that competitive arena. But it is really, really tough. I don't really mind about the, not having the crowds, but it's more the family. Because what the Olympics is, is it shows all those people around you who've supported you and, and who love you and you, who you've dedicated that life away from them for, they can come and share that moment with you. So that's what I find really tough that, that no one else is, is allowed to be there. And that's why, but I will say one thing, the teams are really connected a lot more because they're having to bubble and, and be there for each other. Well, it, it's obviously starting in a couple of days time. You're going up to uh, Manchester, Salford, where you'll be covering it. You've not gone out to, to Beijing, to China yourself. The time difference is going to be quite strange. I mean, I read that NBC are keeping all of their commentators uh, at home. Presumably there are some BBC presenters and commentators who are going to be on location. What is the general plan for the, for the coverage? Are we going to have to get up in the middle of the night or are we going to be able to get up first thing and find out what happened the previous day? So yeah, we have a very small team out there. We've got Jenny Jones in the mountains uh, doing all of the mountain support, so all of the interviews, and Matt Pinsent. Um, is out there as well. We have a show through the night and all through the day. So we've got a morning show, a breakfast show. So a lot of the commentators and experts who are working live on the nights, because for alpine skiing, it's like one till 5 a.m., um, will then go on the morning shows to be the expert on that. I, for instance, I'm on the afternoon show. So I start at, um, between three and six, and then Claire Balding's highlight show is on seven till eight. 
And um, so I'm kind of doing that section. So it's quite tough um, for logistics for everyone because there have to be two people for each job. Because otherwise, I mean, last Olympics, I ended up doing 24 hours a day all day because I was so excited. And then I was in the studio and I think I was on copious amounts of coffee and I'm going to try and take better care of myself this time. But at the same time, I want to watch the events live. I, you, you don't get the same buzz if you know the results in the morning. So I'll be up at night kind of scheduling my sleep throughout the day. Because I think four years ago, you made a big impression on Claire Balding when you came in and you ended up doing more and more programmes as the Olympics went on. Is that how it worked? This time you're you're all scheduled in advance. Yes, last time, I've known Claire for a long time um, and we've got very different energies, but we work very well together and we've done quite a few presenting jobs together. And yeah, I wasn't scheduled to do as much as I was last time. And then after the first show, they were like, oh, this is great. We need someone to kind of bring this this passion and this silliness. I've got quite a pressure on this time because they're like, oh, what are you going to do this time? You made a Bob say out of a box last time and you did this and this and this. <laughs> and I taught, you know, uh, Chris and Jane Torbel and Dean how to do tuck and aerodynamics. So um, we've got quite a funky studio this time. We've got green rooms and we've got an outside bit and a chalet and an indoor bit. Um, and there's an experts room. So I'll be like delivering with a massive screen to d- divide up where athletes were faster on sections of the course and others and I'm also doing more sports that I'm having to learn about I don't know if anyone saw my tweet about moguls <laughs> um, so that's just been dropped on me but as, as I said I think I love to learn um, I I will never put my hand up and say I know everything. So I think I'm an okay person to try and take that challenge on. Well, I'm definitely looking forward to it. I'm not sure how much of it I will be getting up in the middle of the night for. Uh, we'll see about that. Uh, let me let me ask my other two guests here. Um, Al, uh, do, will you be getting up in the night to watch any of the action live? The curling, yeah. maybe. <laughs> I love curling. It's brilliant. <laughs> uh, I, I get as, you know get up to date with as much as I can through the day. But yeah. It's a manic time of year for all of us that work in skiing. So, What about yourself, yeah, Rob? Yeah. Will you be watching any of it live or will you be tuning I, in for Chemi's update in the afternoon? Yeah, I mean, obviously I'll be watching as much as I can. Whether I'll, I'll watch it live or not, I, I don't know. I think I'm tempted to set the alarm clock for the slalom, the men's slalom, obviously, with what happened with Dave. You know, I, I just love the slalom and I love the format of it and watching those two runs. And it's such an exciting race to watch, that second run especially. But I, I watched both runs, but... As for Al, actually, the curling, quite a few of the events in the finals will be on like breakfast time um, because of the hour change. So it's more the the races that we, we generally see in the mornings that will be very early in the morning in Beijing. But they're pushing a lot of the finals to to breakfast time. I've said I've said this before that my kids just love the uh, ski across and the board across. And, you know, that's what we'll be watching. <laughs> Chemi's just been joined by her children. You can t- you can unmute if you want to. Uh, we'll have a we'll, we'll, so, uh, so have a the, these two. These two are actually future free skiers. They don't like peace skiing. This one likes yeah. jumps, half pipes and trees. That was a lovely interruption, Chemi. That was great. And actually, that really brings me on to, you know, I was planning to finish off. I read a really uh, interesting article by you in The Telegraph, I think, about you know why a family ski holiday is so good. And it had this quote in it that I just thought was brilliant. And uh, it says, uh, skiing is a perfect sport for personal growth. Everyone falls. It's a picking oneself up and trying again that is the win. And I just thought, wow, that is brilliant. I'm going to like type that out and put it on the wall. You know, you nail it in one go there. But it's something that we all do, whether you're learning to ski or you're an elite skier, we all fall over and have to be resilient enough to pick ourselves up and know that we can't let that fall inhibit this passion that we have for what we're doing in the mountains. And, and that's why I think it's such a good multi-generational sport, because we're all going through the same personal growth. But whether that personal growth is going from a snowplow to a to you know a plow parallel or an arc with a big angle i just think it's it's such a great sport for that brilliant i really enjoyed that article and and, and thanks very much for all of that insight into you know what we can look forward to over the next uh, couple of weeks i'm just going to do a quick roundup on some of the more recent results we had the x game since our last episode zoe atkin took a fourth and kirsty muir a fifth in the super pipe woodsy got sixth in the slope style Gus Kenworthy got ninth in the super pipe. So those are all um, you know, good results that definitely indicate they're all potential for uh, podiums there. Charlotte Banks has kept up her really good form. She came a third in Cortina. She is number one in the world. Like I said before, anything can happen in snowball cross, but she's 
probably our best chance of a, a medal. And shout out for Jasmine Taylor as well, uh, who's been on the show on uh, on many occasions. Uh, expert in Telemark has had many, many World Cup podiums and she picked up uh, another one this week. Sadly, she won't be at the Olympics. Rob, I'm going to move on to you now. You are in Kron in Switzerland, but more recently you mentioned you've been over in Grindelwald. You obviously mm-hmm. didn't uh, cross over uh, with Chemi on the Lauberhorn itself, but what were you doing? Uh, what were you doing over there? Well, yeah, I was just there after the racing uh, on the Lauberhorn, and of course, really enjoyed skiing that run that was fully open. Did like, you ski it from top to bottom then? I was with a group um, of journalists, and we skied it from top to bottom. But I mean, obviously, we took our time a little bit and stopped yeah. along the way, and I was pointing out some of the little bits. You know, I know the area pretty well. It's just a it's just a lovely piece, isn't it? I skied it there when I was uh, in Murren doing the Inferno a couple of years ago, and mm-hmm. I tried to kind of thought I'd try and ski it fast. Oh my <laughs> god, you know, it's like there is really <laughs> it just when you skied a piece like that, and then you watch them race it, then you really appreciate how good these guys are, don't you? You know, when you're standing there on on some of those sections, and and you know, it is such a long run as well. Obviously, we know it's the longest men's World Cup downhill run. And, and you can see even the, the fittest uh, skiers at the end of, the, of that downhill just absolutely, you know, just, just really, really feeling it. Um, but it's also a run that if you're confident on a, red, a normal red run, you can enjoy it yourself and you can ski down. And if you've watched it on TV and watched it on Ski Sunday, you know, over the years, you'll recognize all those little corners and the jumps and, the, the bits through the tunnel and all of those sections, you know, you, you kind of feel like you you're really there. And, and that's the cool thing about it. I mean, I suppose every, every classic downhill run has that same feeling. Um, but the Lava one is special. I, I, the views are just incredible. You half the time, you're not looking where you're going because you're looking at the Eiger, you know? You're, well, exactly. The, the uh, <sighs> mountain range there is so spectacular the mm. it's the um the eiger the munch and the jungfrau right that's right that, and, and in fact graham bell i think might, might have told us the story of the three of them but uh, i don't think we need to go into the details of the full story but it's the ogre uh, the monk and the young lady you can probably uh, add your own uh in there you go. The story uh what else were you seeing then while you were based in grindelwald <laughs> so they've got a new lift called the eiger express yes it, it's not new this winter it was new last winter um, but obviously, this was the first time that a lot of British people, most British people have had the chance to get on that lift. It has genuinely transformed that side of the mountain. And actually, if you're staying in Wengen as well, it does make a big difference because, you know, you ski down to Grindelwald before you had a couple of options. If you want to get back to Wengen, you'd have to you'd, you'd go on the old gondola um, from the sort of Grun side down at the bottom there. And, and you'd go up to Manlikum, but then you'd have to work your way across on the chairlifts, you know, to get back to Kleiner Scheidegg to then ski down to Wengen. Or you'd take the train from the, from the Grindelwald station and you'd go up to Kleiner Scheidegg that way. It's about a 25-minute journey. Very nice. And I love that sort of whole area with the trains and it's really, especially if the weather's not too good, you know, get on that train, you can kind of dry off and have a, I always get a flask of tea out of my backpack, you know, have a little cup of tea on the train. That's really great. But actually, most people that are skiing there, they want to maximize their ski time. And this lift whisks you up in 15 minutes now from the, the new terminal building, which was yep. where the old gondola used to go from. Now, they've replaced the old Mannequin gondola as well, and that's significantly faster. It still stops at Hollenstein, halfway up. Um, not stops, you know, it goes through Hollenstein. You can get on there or you can get off there. And it goes right the way to the top of Mannequin. But, you know, you want to go back to Wengen. If you're staying in the, on the Wengen side, you can shoot straight back to Grindelwald again into the terminal building. They both go from the same place, those lifts, onto the Eiger Express, 15 minutes. You're, you're above Kleiner Scheidegg there. You're at, you're at the, Eiger, the Eiger Glacier Station. For people who haven't been to the area then, you, I mean, it makes uh, Grindelwald a much better location to stay if you want to access the whole of the Jungfrau region? I mean, absolutely. I think, you know, if you're in Grindelwald, you're, you're accessing the ski area much, much, in a, much, much faster. You've got the first area as well on the other side. That remains the same, so you can choose to go there. If you want to go over to Murren, it is still, you know, it's still a bit of a trek, right? And and actually, if you're in Grindelwald, possibly you'd still go, take the train, make a little change over into Lauterbrunnen, 
and, and up to Moran that way. Uh, when I was in Moran, I was going the opposite direction and it's a bit of a schlep. Um, Chemi, can I ask you a question? I think you skied the Inferno last year over in Moran, but you're obviously in Vengen this year. I, I think I read somewhere on the internet that someone overheard you looking around for a ski instructor for your kids while you're in uh, Vengen. I take it you managed to find one all right then, did you? Yeah, so we went to Vengen and this is when I was in isolation and I felt so bad that my kids were there. That I was like, right, I'll give you know the guys taking care of him some time off them by putting them in ski school and I could find something for my little ones because he was still doing the uh the low level the the snow garden I do have to say I think Swiss ski instructors are amazing um in terms of development for my kids the French ski school they love it um I think it's fun but the Swiss ski school in terms of technique they're definitely a lot better from a week there um but for Lockie I couldn't find anyone because it was a really quiet week so I was having to look at private lessons um and I paid 250 Swiss francs for five days and I was like this is too good to be true um and it was Lockie and one other boy with their own instructor um, great like a great. private lesson like a private lesson anyway so that that one worked out so that is great Chemi managed to find someone also good to hear uh that the Swiss instructors are excellent uh Rob uh, any other points you wanted to make about uh Grindelwald or the Iger Express well it's just worth pointing out that if you're going to Grindelwald to go up the Jungfrau Jock um 3434 meters i think which is a fantastic you know place to to visit to see the glaciers up there and you take a train through the eiger mountain and you stop halfway up and you can get out the train and look through these windows and the eiger is it's incredible um but it's actually a lot easier to reach the young now you you can link up with that at the eiger glacier station you know you're saving you're saving a lot of time um with that new lift uh, significant amounts of time, up to 45 minutes, basically. And the, and the other thing is the terminal building. And this is this is probably one of the most key things with this lift, actually, is the terminal building at the bottom. Because what it does is it links up with the Swiss railway network. So you can go into Interlaken, you can then take the train, it goes straight to the terminal building, and you're out of the terminal building and onto one of those lifts straight away. Really efficient. Well, that sounds great, Rob. And I, I, definitely one of the things I like about the Jungfrau area is the uh, ability to um, you know, take trains as well as uh, everything else. It's great fun. Uh, so the last episode of uh, Ski Sunday included a feature on helmets by Jenny Jones. And I thought this would be a good time to ask our resident equipment uh, expert, Al, about helmets. What do you think, Al? Should you always wear one? You know what? That was a really interesting article, wasn't it? And, and both Shemi and Ed confessed that they now do. You know, I've, I've skied with Shemi quite a bit and yeah the majority of people do wear helmets and i think it's a really good thing and it's not about the massive crashes that we often see on ski programs little things chairlift bars get hitting you on the back of the head little balls just somebody knocking into you a helmet protects against all of these kind of knocks and bangs as well so it just stops the holiday being inconvenienced but modern helmets are so much better than they were 10 years ago, not just all the safety stuff with MIPS and all the development the helmet brands have got, but just the fit, comfort and how much air we get through them. The vast majority of people now wear helmets and you see this in the results. So if you were looking to buy one, what do you think you should be looking for? What's the most important elements of it? Without a doubt, the first thing has to be fit. We're all unique. We have different nooks and crannies around our heads, different shapes. Go and try the helmet on. And if you've got your own goggles or you've got, you prefer to wear sunglasses or you've got prescription glasses, take them with you and try them on with the helmet and try a few different helmets on to make sure that they fit. That's the most important thing. And then there's other features. In Europe, we look at a standard, a CEN number 1077, but there's actually two kinds of helmets you can have. So for racing, we have the category A where they've got ear pads, the hard sides, and they have to have that but most of us just use a category B helmet, which has slightly different regulations around it. And that means we can take the ear pads off. So if you want to run your helmet over your goggles, have the strap underneath, so a bit more of a freestyle look, you can do. If you're going to wear it in the summer, you can do. And actually, there's quite a few helmets now that will be multi-norm, so you can use them for cycling, for skiing, and for climbing. And that means that you buy one helmet that's going to do lots of things, and if you're going to do different kinds of adventures, maybe you're going to do some Scottish Highland touring when you're going to cycle in and then you're going to climb up to, to, to the quarries <laughs> and go skiing, then that's when you would look at these multi norm helmets. Yeah, I like that idea. I'm wondering how many of our listeners are going to be cycling in and then doing a ski touring. But a multi-adaptable helmet is a really good idea for sure. Then quite a, a lot of people were doing this, and not just in Scotland. In the Alps, we saw people cycling and then, and then hiking, climbing, and then skiing. So yeah, 
they are limited in the number of people that will have them, but with the growth in ski touring, then yeah. they're of more interest. Okay, and I guess those things that you're talking about apply as far as renting as well. I mentioned earlier I was in Les Arc last weekend, and why you know I, I got in there on the Saturday morning. I got off the train quite early. I thought I'm I'm going to get on the slopes as quickly as I can, but a lot of people had obviously arrived maybe on Friday or, or whatever. It was quite busy in there, and one of the reasons it, it was processed fairly quickly. This is the Intersport in Les Arc, but they were giving people the chance to try helmets and not just giving them one and just saying, right, that's you done. They gave them one, let them try it, took it back, etc. So if you're renting a helmet, you should go through that process as well. That is the most relevant point of everything anybody would consider when going to rent a helmet. Don't be afraid to say, actually, I'm not too sure about this one. Can I just try another one, please? And try it on. Because if the helmet doesn't fit you correctly, it's not going to give you the protection that it was designed for. And you mentioned MIPS before. That was uh, also in the Ski Sunday feature. Do you want to elaborate on that? What does that stand for? Yeah, so MIPS is multi-directional impact protection. So it doesn't protect you from numerous impacts. It's about rotational forces. So you imagine that in the test for helmets, there is a, you know, the helmet gets dropped onto a flat platform. That's a European standard. Life isn't that simple. So if you hit an angle and your head is going to get pulled one way or the other, the MIPS creates a sliding layer, so it slows down how quickly the brain is getting jerked inside the skull, is the easiest way to think about it. MIPS is brilliant, and then other helmet brands have come up with other systems to improve on that. So Giro and Bell have got a lab laboratory that they work with MIPS. They've got a new system whereby essentially there's two inside polystyrene shells. One rotates inside the other like a ball and socket. That's called spherical, and we'll see more of those for next season. Shred who are big in racing, they have their own version of MIPS. Atomic has their AMID phone, which again does it in a different way. And then Sweet, a Scandinavian company, they do some really interesting things with helmets with different densities of foams and combine that with different thicknesses. And just looking at what how the human head is shaped and what different angles in the head need different levels of protection. And they work with MIPS in developing their systems as well. There's a lot of interesting tech. It's all about giving us comfort, and protection but the main thing is make sure it fits if it's not comfortable you won't be wearing it that's really interesting intersport who i'd normally go into their shops when i go away but uh listener i'd certainly recommend them they will always give you a helmet and give you a choice of uh, helmets when you're uh, there just uh, just how good for kids so you're not buying new helmets every year i do this all the time when i go away with my kids get them a rental helmet it's brilliant it saves you know loads of money and they can change the helmet and the, there's a whole selection of colors it just works really well <laughs> although a good tip if you are going with more than one kid make sure they get a different colored helmet <laughs> like it makes yeah, it a lot easier yeah, at the start yeah. of the day okay uh well we're coming to the end of the show now reviews and comments are, uh, are always welcome wherever you want to leave them whether it's on apple podcasts or spotify social media or by email uh, and you can email me to thesgeekpodcast at gmail.com. You can also buy me a coffee if you want to at buymeacoffee.com forward slash ski podcast. I'd like to thank Paul Bond, who bought me a couple of coffees and also said, uh, your podcast is a danger to my pocket. It makes me book more trips than I sensibly should. Uh, great stuff. Uh, and finally, I mentioned earlier that uh, the Ski Podcast has been nominated as Best Winter Sports Podcast. It's very easy to vote. Uh, it would be great if you could take a couple of minutes just to go to the um, sportspodcastawards.com. Uh, and I'd really appreciate it. And I'd like to thank all those people who voted for us already. For now, I'd like to say thank you, Switzerland Tourism, for sponsoring the show. And I'd like to thank my guest today, Chimmy. Thank I know you've got to go. Me. No worries, uh, Chimmy. Thanks for joining us. Rob. Thanks, Ian. And Al. Thanks, Ian. Final listener, thank you for joining us and until next time, goodbye. Well, listener, you'll never know what a challenge that edit was. It was extremely complicated to cut it down and cut it all together. We had a problem with uh, Al's audio and a, a little bit of interference on uh, Rob's uh, mic. And Chimmy had to leave us halfway through. Anna Children came in at one point as well. Um, but, you know, if you enjoyed it, you're very welcome to buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com forward slash the ski podcast. I'd appreciate it. And let's just finish off uh, with Chimmy's definitive word on ski helmets.
I always wore one. I'm I and I make all of the, our coaches wear one too. No, I've um, since I broke my bet my neck when I was eleven. It's always on my radar. I never ski without it. 